Uh, hi, welcome everyone. My name is Carl Brook, and I am Director of International Programs at the Environmental Law Institute. Welcome to our sixth live office hour for the MOOC on Environmental Security and Sustaining Peace. I'm here with Erica Weinthal. Erica is one of the core faculty for this course. Erica is the Lee Hill Snowden Professor of Environmental Policy at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. She specializes in global environmental politics and environmental security. She has a particular emphasis on water and energy. Some of her areas of research currently ongoing include global environmental politics and governance, environmental conflict and peace building, the political economy of the resource curse, and climate change adaptation. Erica's research spans multiple geographic regions, including the Soviet successor states, the Middle East, South Asia, East Africa, and North America. Today, we'll be answering a mix of questions, some that were submitted by students ahead of uh, the session, and some that we'll be receiving from you live. We'll do our best to get through all of them. If we don't, we encourage you to post your questions in the office hours and other discussion groups. And so with that, I'd um, like to welcome Erica. And uh, Erica, maybe you could say a little bit more about some of your uh, ongoing research, particularly um, uh, one of the recent things you've been working on with uh, targeting of water infrastructure. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, greetings from a very sunny Durham, North Carolina. Um, so um, my current research has somewhat um, transitioned a bit from earlier in my career. I worked at looking at um, more water cooperation and conflict, looking at how states can use water as a tool for peace building, especially in the former Soviet Union and um, Central Asia. And over time, um, I've moved more um, looking at a different part of the conflict cycle, rather than looking at how water is a tool in the mediation process or in the post-conflict, going back to what happens during conflict and trying to understand the ways in which both states and non-state actors target different forms of resources and infrastructure associated with natural resources. And, um, and in particular, water is one of the examples. So trying to understand and map out, um, you know, under what conditions different actors target infrastructure and the impacts that it has for human security, for human well-being, health, livelihoods, but also um, in prolonging a conflict in many ways. So looking at um, in the conflicts in the Middle East, um, primarily post 2011, but in some cases extending back decades because many of the wars in the Middle East are protracted conflicts, trying to look at the impacts of taking out water installations, um, electric um, you know, power plants, transportation, health facilities, um, the agricultural sector. Um, so that's been one of the areas that I've been focusing on um, over the last few years um, from a research perspective. Excellent. Um, wondering, okay. there, there is a question that just came in. Um, this is more on the, uh, on the post-conflict side or the ending of conflict um, from Ruba Park. While cooperation over water management has shown some positive outcome on the Jordanian-Israeli front, it has failed on the Palestinian-Israeli front. What could be done to use water to build trust? <sighs> it's a great question. Um, I mean, one of the things that makes the um, Israel-Palestinian conflict um, so complicated is also the way that natural resources are so intricately um, wrapped up in the conflict. And this, these are questions about who um, uses the resources, access to the resources, restrictions, especially within the West Bank on being able to drill new wells, um, to build new infrastructure, to you know expand access um, to um, drinking water services, water treatment. And, you know, there's, you know, water was a core component of the Oslo Accords, but it was also left much of it to final status negotiations. So, 
you know, that has made it really tricky because in many ways by prolonging and delaying um, a formal agreement over water resources, it has broken down some of the trust that it initially helped build by acknowledging that water was an was essential to all, you know, for livelihoods, um, especially for the Palestinian population. That was a signal that water could be a mechanism for building trust. But as negotiations have stalled and essentially um, ceased to continue, that in many ways has led to the breakdown of trust. Um, and, you know, where, so I, you know, if one were to look moving forward at this point, you know, there hasn't been much movement at the high level negotiations where, you know, between state negotiators, um, where we do see some progress and opportunities for building trust um, would be at the really, I would argue at the very local level where you're having people come together um, at the level of communities and citizens and local governments um, to really talk about the importance of water, to try to um, work together through educational um, events, try, um, or um, at the scientific level, because there's still a need for good scientific research. So trying to find new ways to allow for some continuation of face-to-face -face discussions or even programming, like finding ways to build new forms of water treatment facilities that may be much smaller scale um, could provide some opportunities for building trust when you have a political vacuum as we have today. I wonder if there's a difference on uh, water quality and water quantity, if there might be more opportunities, say, on water quality, that there's often agreement on that. Um, where, there, where there might be more entrenched disputes over water quantity? Um, I mean, negotiators often like to um, come up with a water, you know, a figure of this is how much we're going to allocate. Um, but that's also, you know, and that becomes very tricky because increasingly we're seeing drought in many parts of the world where water um, has played a role in the conflict or has been contentious. And so, um, you know, when one negotiates over water quality or quantity, um, one puts, you know, themselves at risk because if you have drought, you're, you're not sort of saying, oh, what's the percentage we're going to reallocate? Um, then there isn't enough, you know, in this water pie to distribute. So water quality um, is often left out of the equation because everybody's, you know, pr um, concerned with making sure people have access to water. Um, and, you know, water quality is, um, is probably as important or even more important because even if you're um, allocating water, if you're not allocating good water, people aren't using it. Um, and so, that's, you know, again, where there's opportunities, at least on the scientific side, to try to figure out how do you treat the water, what is, you know, what could serve as potable water. Um, but, you know, most conflicts in the world, people really do focus on the allocation of water rather than thinking about are there alternative forms of water? Can we use new technologies to provide clean water, recycling water, desalination? of brackish water, for example. Um, in that case, it, I remember seeing an article uh, about some of the Israeli technology and desal, and both on the how to do desal and then how to use it, say, for agricultural purposes, that they've developed a lot of uh, innovative technologies. Is this uh, something that could be a space for an opportunity for peace, or is this that, that there are some bigger issues that need to be resolved first? Well, um, I would agree that there are bigger issues that need to be resolved first. Um, and just to give the example, you know, desalination could be um, an incredibly important technology in Gaza for providing potable water, um, you know, given the coastline and, and 
investments from the international community in desalination plants. Um, at the same time, because of the blockade imposed upon Gaza, this has led to restrictions in the import of you know, the materials that would be needed to build desalination plants and run them. Um, so even if the technology exists, the, um, the realities of an, you know, a blockade, um, an internationally imposed blockade, largely by Israel and Egypt, um, and has led to the prevention of being able to actually leverage um, desalination technology. That said, you know, desalination is not my area of expertise, but there are other limitations with desalination, um, with, you know, using the water in the agricultural sector for certain types of crops. And so one really needs to look at the water quality that is produced um, for what you could grow um, using desal desalinated water. It's, and it's also, you probably don't want to use, you know, um, it's a very expensive source of water for the agricultural sector. No, I was, I was just wondering, because I remember uh, Israel, th there were some pilots looking at it, and one of the troubles when you do, when you have desal is that you take out other things, yeah. minerals that are essential for plants, including boron. Uh, um, it actually kind of remains in such. So boron is something that needs to be, um, removed uh, ah. is my understanding, but boron. A lot of crops are very sensitive to boron. Okay. Yeah. Um, but again, this is not my area of expertise. There are other people who focus okay. on that. Um, I'm, maybe start with a big picture question. Um, uh, you work on a lot of. Uh, is, Questions that are very scary: water security, energy security, um, uh, how people get clean water. Um, what keeps you up at night? What are the big issues that you think really need attention, uh, thinking, and political? Um, what keeps me up at night? <laughs> um, in many, I mean, it goes back to where my research is really focused today um, and really trying to think about, you know, how do you extend access to basic services? Um, and it's, you know, it's about extending, you know, water, um, energy, often in conflict affected regions. and. Um, you know, the perpetual question is, we were able to do so many amazing things um, technologically these days, at, but we're still not able to provide clean water to nearly, you know, 800 million people in the world. There's still 2.5 billion people in the world without access to, um, you know, proper sanitation. These, these are, you know, in many ways, a minimum of what we should expect as global citizens for the rest of the population. And so those are, you know, some of the questions that I really spend a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, what in many ways are the core, um, the fundamentals of what the sustainable development goals are trying to address. Um, you know, what is the role of natural resources in conflict affected regions, but also bringing people out of poverty, building just and equitable societies. So um, as it is, today is World Water Day. <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, the Guardian has an article uh, 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 in today's paper um, about uh, dirty water kills 20 times more children than bullets in conflict-affected areas. Uh, and it, it, it sounds like uh, that's, you know, that's putting a number on, um, on the things that you're working on. Yeah, I mean, those are the numbers that are really hard um, to quantify, and that's one of the challenges in our research is trying to really figure out what are these long-term health impacts of losing access to basic services in conflict. 
um, in the water volume that I co-edited that came out of um, <laughs> the project that we had on natural resource management and post-conflict peace building, which Carl will soon show you. Um, you know, one of the issues that we tr tried to, um, or you can find on environmentalpeacebuilding.org, um, there we go. Um, one of the issues that we tried to underscore was that there, there is a global obsession with counting civilian deaths in conflict um, as part of understanding the cost of war. It's quite, you know, counting bodies is often easier than counting the number of incidents of cholera, um, counting, you know, how many people have died from waterborne illnesses, um, looking at sort of the long-term impacts on human development um, from not having access to water or other basic services. Um, and that, you know, for me, I think is one of, um, it's a call to action um, that we really need to understand better these longer term impacts or what scholars such as Rob Nixon have called, you know, the slow violence that takes place um, during war or during conflict. I'm wondering, how does the human right to water factor into this analysis? So rhetorically or uh, from a more binding perspective, it's a human right. Yeah, I mean, the UN has made some progress on call, you know, on acknowledging water as a, as a, um, as a human right. Um, but, you know, this isn't something that has been, um, you know, internalized or um, written into most countries' constitutions. Um, you know, different, you know, there's been huge disputes over water is a resource that should be priced, that it's a commodity rather than a human right. Um, and we've seen tremendous variation across the globe on how different countries approach water, different societies, different religions, how they have different perspectives on how to use water. Um, you know, the um, outbreak of um, what's known as the water wars in Bolivia, when they tried to privatize water in Cochabamba is the extreme example of this conflict over um, trying to fully, you know, um, make water a commodity versus you know, South Africa that tried to ingrain this notion of water as a human right that everybody's entitled to a basic minimum and then afterwards um, you pay for water, trying to find a mixed hybrid ground. Um, you know, it's, this, is, this is a question that I think all societies need to struggle with um, because, you know, and this is something the Sustainable Development Goals has also been trying to acknowledge. Um, the Millennium Development Goals really focused on um, extending access to improved sources of water and extending access to a tap um, or some type of, you know, water well that you could go to and, you know, um, as, um, you know fill, up, uh, fill up some water um, and, you know, and jerry cans and things like that, but not really thinking about the quality of water, whether water is affordable, whether that you have 24-7 water. Many people have water taps but may not have access to clean water you know 24 hours in the day and so this has been the transition from the millennium development goals to the sustainable development goals really thinking more about these qualitative um, aspects characteristics of you know we just don't need access to water going back also to this issue of quantity but we really need access to good water that we can use all the time um, to ensure that people have productive and healthy lives. I was just wondering if the human right to water might also provide certain mechanisms for accountability in some of the targeting, some of the uh, affirmative wrongs that are done. Um, so are you, just to clarify, are you thinking about um, having states or parties to a conflict clearly acknowledge that water resources should be protected during conflict and after conflict that this is based that if water is a human right we should there should um 
it should be um, forbidden to attack water infrastructure installations in conflict. Because, For example, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the jurisprudence seems to suggest that um, even if water is a human right, which as you say is you know, some countries contest or some parties contest, right. um, even if it is a human right, uh, it doesn't mean that states have to provide water to everyone tomorrow. They have to have a, it's a progressive right. You right. realize it progressively. Um, but there's a non-regression aspect that comes out of the human rights side. That you can't undo what you've done so far. You need to kind of expand, expand, expand. And efforts of targeting would seem to be intentional direct violations of those human rights, which right. would invite questions of how do you hold people accountable and I'm, I'm just wondering if, if people or parties. Yeah. I'm, yeah, this is where there's lots, I mean, you know better than I do the discussions that are taking place in the realm of international law on accountability for, um, you know, destroying water systems. Um, you know, the, the only case that we really have of where a state has been held accountable was in the aftermath of the first Gulf War after you know, Iraq targeted the Kuwaiti oil fields, which led to tremendous water contamination. Um, there wasn't much accountability left you know, for the um, drying up of the marshlands though. Um, so you see a huge divergence of when we decide you know, this was something that should not have happened from something that we just you know, acknowledge was a wrong, but there is no accountability. So it, it seems like there might be some other areas where there's small data points, especially when it comes to scorched earth tactics and ethnic cleansing. So the the, the indictment of Omar Bashir uh, on genocide, one of the claims there was that he had poisoned wells. So it wasn't at going after the, the crime of poisoning wells. It was the poisoning of wells was indicative or was one of these actions that was taken uh, with genocidal intent. Yeah, I mean, and that is useful for precedence. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, it hasn't meant that there's been any follow-up, but if there is an, an increasing acknowledgement um, that, you know, these are areas where there should be, you know, this is a um, drawing a red line. Like, these are areas you should not um, explicit, you know, explicitly poison civilians. Um, but, you know, international law, again, as you know better than I know, has been very weak and fully articulating what happens in internal conflicts. It's, a, it's much better at interstate wars. Um, it often focuses on the survival of civilians, so poisoning wells is that, you know, that's probably much clearer because you're really harming civilians, but if you're you know, destroying irrigation systems, that becomes much more fuzzy. Yeah. Um, or collateral damage. So I did want to show for people, this is a <laughs> book that Erica had mentioned. With um, the other co-authors, if you can look. <laughs> um, so <laughs> these are the uh, co-editors, uh, Erica, Jessica Troll, and Mikyasu Nakayama. Um, this is, as Erica said, available on the Environmental Peacebuilding Knowledge Platform, environmentalpeacebuilding.org. If you go under publications and books, you can download the, uh, the various chapters free of charge. I'd like to shift gears a little. There's a question from uh, Bukunola Ayo. Uh, hi, in a country like Nigeria that is blessed with renewable and non-renewable resources, how can the government manage the resources to prevent further crisis in the Niger Delta region. And that's, uh, the, that, that's very interesting uh, on both the renewable and non-renewable in the same space, the, uh, the, the poisoning or the, the pollution of the waters and the equity around uh, oil and benefits from that. Uh, Erica, you've, you've thought about both the energy side of the resource curse and the water. It, it all comes together in the Niger Delta. Yeah. Um and the Niger Delta, I mean, in many ways, is the classic case that we turn to to really understand um, the long-term negative impacts of what we now call the resource curse, um, which has to do with when a country is richly endowed with um, 
oil and gas resources or other mineral resources, and you do not see um, the benefits of those resources leading to economic development, rising levels of human development, um, you know, um, investments in education. Often you see a deterioration in the political context. Um, you see less democracy, you see more forms of conflict, in some places civil war. Um, and Nigeria has been a case that is, it's extremely rich in oil and gas, but has not seen any um, remarkable improvements in pulling people out of poverty. In many cases, there's been a stagnation. Um, and in the Niger Delta, you've seen people's lives um, deteriorate from the quality of living next to um, when, you know, gas is flared as part of the extraction of oil, um, but also seeing the contamination of soil, contamination of water. Um, so there is a there is a concerted need for addressing the um, the benefits, how the benefits of the oil and gas revenue, if one continues to extract oil and gas, um, you know, globally, I think we're all there is a, a much needed push to renewables and thinking about alternatives. Um, but and this is one of the challenges in the post conflict setting, is whether countries should rely upon those. Um, those non-renewable natural resources as a quick fix because it generates money very quickly that can be used for supporting this, the functions of the state. Mm -hmm. But often those resources are siphoned off um, into funding the military or somehow disappear um, if you are, if there's um, a tendency for corruption and not invested in education, human development, um, you know, other expanding um, other forms of economic um, development. So really thinking about diversification of the economy. Um, so I think for Nigeria, Nigeria is at a very critical point right now. Um, largely, you know, UNEP had been involved doing a long-term assessment in the Niger Delta looking at the impacts of oil and gas and trying to come up with a remediation plan um, for the Niger Delta. Um, and so this is this is an area where I think, you know, a great opportunity to rethink, you know, how one uses, um, how a country uses its natural resources for the benefit of its population. Um, but also, you know, how does, Nigeria has to really think about how do you clean up um, the impact on the soil and on the water, on the um, on the renewable side, and really think about how to expand the opportunities for diversifying the economy. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, just because of this tendency to concentrate the wealth of um, oil and gas revenue in the hands of the central state and not in the, that doesn't benefit the um, broader civilian population. Um, there's a separate question coming back to the Jordan River from Ye Wen. When I watched the video of the Jordan River case study, the river dries up year by year. So what plan or strategy is good for the Jordan River? I think that depends on who you ask, <laughs> because I mean, one of the things about water uh, resource management is there are so many people who are invested in using a water resource in different ways. Um, the agricultural sector would say the water needs to benefit, you know, those that are employed in agriculture. Um, so a lot of the water in the Jordan River is allocated for agriculture on both sides of the Jordan River. Um, you know, the Middle East has had, um, in the 2000s, had a very long period of drought. Um, and so that led to a lot of the drying up of the river. Um, you know, a lot of the river is allocated by everyone before it, you know, gets to the Dead Sea. So there's also implications for the Dead Sea 
um, that there's less and less water flowing into the Dead Sea. It's led to the deterioration of the water quality in the Jordan River. Much of the Jordan River is really um, almost sewage. Um, there have been plans um, to build a desalination plant um, in Aqaba and a, um, a water conveyance um, system to transfer water um, up towards the Dead Sea brines and to try to transfer water between Israel, Jordan and some, you know, to Palestine. It's a very complicated scheme that keeps changing um, depending on who's supporting it at what time and what donors are involved. Um, so, you know, but a lot of the environmentalists um, are not in favor of that plan. Um, a lot of, you know, political negotiators are in favor of the plan because it's a way, going back to the first question, of keeping political actors talking about water, um, even though the environmental effects are very questionable of what it would mean for the river itself, but also for the Dead Sea. Um, with these water transfers. So, um, so it, you know, it really depends on who's, you know, who you're talking to and what their interests are. I don't think at this point one could ever say there is a very good framework. Um, Eco Peace Middle East has, um, has its own proposal for managing the Jordan River. That would be one place to look. The World Bank has done numerous assessments of this um, Dead Sea conveyance project. One could go there to look at their assessments of um, different plans for managing the Jordan River. It, um, it, it's interesting. Both of these questions highlight, uh, I, I would say two things. One is very difficult situations for which there aren't good solutions uh, or aren't clear solutions right. that really make everything work. The other, which uh, ties into another question, is um, uh, you're often dealing with multiple sectors, multiple uses. And uh, there's a question, how do you convince decision makers who are very focused on one resource or one sector for economic development to diversify and consider additional options? Uh, have you seen successful examples of diversifying investments for better economic resilience following conflict. And thinking about, you know, the Niger Delta, uh, the Nigeria um, is a question, especially if uh, the reports are true that Nigeria is on the kind of on the tail end of their oil reserves. Um, what happens? Uh, how do you diversify the economy um, in the Jordan River? Uh, you know, is it, uh, are you focusing on ag or uh, are there other uses that make sense? How do you balance these? And how do you diversify the economy? Really, how do you talk to the decision makers to diversify the economy? Yeah, um, you know, I think this is where, you know, going back, you know, to some of the ways we've organized the MOOC and thinking about the conflict cycle. Um, where there's different opportunities um, to have impact on the way natural resources are managed and could provide opportunities for peace building. And one area is probably where there's a, um, a potential entry point is during the negotiations and trying, you know, at the point where people are sitting down at the table and thinking about what that, um, peace agreement might look like or um, steps for moving forward in the post-conflict reconstruction process. So after, you know, when the UN or other organizations come in and do these rapid assessments, um, those are the opportunities to really um, think about and provide um, guidance on how one could diversify. One way often that we neglect is who sits at the table? Who's, you know, making those decisions? Is it the same, you know, do we just want political leaders and combatants at the table or do we want a much more diversified table um, bringing women into the negotiating space? We've often seen that women are left out of these peace negotiations and you know, some would argue that women 
have a different perspective on how to use natural resources because often they are the ones who are having to go find water resources, um, are working on the, you know, in the agricultural sector, you know, for their day-to-day -day subsistence and, you know, have a different understanding of um, what matters for um, everyday livelihoods. For Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm I was just wondering if you could amplify on that. You know, um, it, it, how might the decisions be different? What, 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 uh, what, how might we, how, how might the decision making process decide to use water differently um, if women's voices are included? Right, right. So I think it's like, you know, it could be water, it also could be land, and I'll make another plug for our, the land volume from the, that's part of the, um, you know, the whole series of books that were published because there's wonderful case studies talking about land and land tenure. Um, and, you know, one of the areas there is making sure, you know, thinking about um, tenure laws in a post-conflict setting. In many cases, you know, there are a lot of women who are left um, as, you um, the single head of a household but may not actually have access or um, the laws do not allow for female ownership of land. So how do you think about changing tenure and ownership laws to allow for women to really be able to own their agricultural plots? When it comes to water, thinking about where, you know, how to, um, you know, at a much more micro level, uh, where to drill new wells, where to um, build infrastructure so that women do not have to um, walk very far or that if there was tension between communities, some of our case studies show if you let women negotiate over water, they actually, it was much easier for them to negotiate between different villages because they understood the importance of water. And um, so it's, it's giving a voice to women at the table, um, but also thinking about the institutional constraints that prevent women from having um, ownership over natural resources that could be vital for their family's future. So this is the book that Erica was just <laughs> talking about, Land and Post-Conflict Peace Building, edited by John Unra and Rodri Williams. Um, the, the the water land uh, nexus, I think, is very interesting. Um, uh, research that is about to be published by uh, Jessica Troll here at ELI with Stephanie Keene and Chloe Ginsberg at the Rights and Resources Initiative um, is looking at uh, customary tenure regimes around the world for water. So which countries recognize customary tenure for indigenous people, for communities, for um, uh, ethnic minorities. And um, they find that in where, the, the, the places where customary rights to water are recognized, usually are where they recognize customary rights to land and the resources pertinent to land. So if you have rights to land, then you have rights to water. And so that, that linkage that you're describing, Eric, I think it becomes uh, even more clear in, in this uh, analysis of customary water rights. And it's really, and in many cases, thinking about the intersectoral connections between natural resources at the end, of, you know, at, at war's end, um, rather than trying to say, okay, now the forestry folks have to go and negotiate over forestry land, water over water, um, you know, energy over energy, but we're living in a world where all these resources are connected and people are dependent upon multiple resources at the same time. So Erica, how, you know, if, if, uh, if one studies water, one learns certain uh, systems and concepts and tools. If one studies land tenure, there's another whole set of uh, tools and concepts. If you work on energy, that's a whole nother realm. Um, you've worked on a number of these uh, uh, in a number of these realms. 
for somebody who wants to get, uh, look at these nexus issues, right? How do you, you know, what sort of study or how do you, how do people, how how best to approach this? From a purely academic side, or a practitioner, or oh, you know, how, how do you think about it? What sort of skills do you need? Um, what do you need to be aware of or cautious of? So, you know, I think the most important thing in any situation when you're looking at, say, a country, a region, um, in a post-conflict setting, is to try to have a full understanding of both the physical context, the political context, um, you know, the social context, not to come in with one's blinder. We often presume having deep, deep expertise is the way to go. Um, and that's wonderful. Like, so if you're a water quality person, that is great. And if you have an engineering solution for treating water, that is fantastic. But if you bring it in to a particular situation where you don't have a good understanding of the institutional context that could support it, um, as you know, we've seen in much of the development literature, a lot of these solutions fail. So I, you know, as someone who studies political institutions, I, you know having a deep understanding of the context is critical um, along with having that um, those levels of expertise. So even if you study, you know, also waste treatment, you're still going to have to think about how it connects with the water sector, um, with, you know, land use, because if you're having to, you know, figure out where you're going to, you um, you know, how you're going to treat the waste, where you're going to deposit it. Um, you know, these are issues that we all struggle with that are related to broader issues of environmental justice and equity, where you cite a um, waste disposal site. And one, you know, one needs that nuance to work in a post-conflict setting. I think, you know, if you're a student wanting to go into these fields, um, Gaining, you know, lots of technical skills are really great. You know, um, in the MOOC, we've highlighted a lot of different mapping technologies through MapX, um, working with data, but you also need the field expertise to really understand, you know, um, what data you can actually use, what the local context looks like. So trying to have that balance between um, studying some of these new um, technologies that are very useful, um, but also making sure that one gets field experience as a, if you're a student wanting to go into any of these fields. I ask because I feel like um, the world has become a lot more integrated in the last 20 to 30 years, that um, the, these, uh, these sorts of multi-sectoral transdisciplinary approaches this this was only starting to happen you know 20 years ago 30 years ago and now um it's it is very mainstream um yes and no i mean i think what we do as a part of the environmental peace building association is try to highlight those connections. But there are still a lot of, you know, conferences or venues that just focus on water, focus on health, focus on, you know, the extractives. And I, I think because, um, you know, those of us who are really concerned about this concept of environmental security, environmental peace building, we, we take a longer view because we understand that natural resources can play so many different roles in the conflict cycle, but you can also, it's not a linear process where you're moving from conflict to peace building, but you can actually revert back to conflict. And so you have to, it, you know, it has to be more nuanced. And good, good points. Um, we have two last questions, I think, before we close. Um, uh, one is from uh, Frank Columba. 
regarding climate change, how can we address the issue to the political authorities in, to, in order to build peace in a region devastated by resource conflict? Um, so there's, again, I'm just highlighting um, because we're limited by time, but we have a lot of chapters um, in the vol across all the volumes that look at how one programs in a way that um, the programming is conflict or climate sensitive. Um, so really um, using some of the tools that uh, um, many of our colleagues have um, developed, such as Richard Matthew at UC Irvine, on climate sensitive approaches to um, peace building, but which in many ways think, you know, it means thinking about the natural resources that we're going to, that countries are going to rely upon for um, rebuilding and not returning to the extractive sector, um, but also understanding that, you know, the linkages between, you know, if drought played a role in, um, um, in contributing to the conflict, how do you then think about the agricultural sector? Um, and so I think these are, you know, these are very specific w issues that need to be addressed throughout, um, you know, throughout the negotiations about, you know, how development works, always having this cl climate sensitive framework in developing programs. Yeah. So I, I think that what, one of the things you're saying there is the, um, the that it, when you develop or think about your programs and projects, it becomes part of the filtering, you know, yeah. do we, do we want to promote agriculture here if we don't, think that agriculture is viable in the longer run or certain forms of ag. Right. Um, the, a couple other uh, things that come to mind. One is that you see in a number of countries, uh, post-conflict countries, as part of the rebuilding, the delivery of uh, basic services, uh, the introduction of renewable energy technologies, solar, wind, um, mini hydro or micro hydro power, so that we see that. And one of the things that we saw elsewhere, I think it was in Haiti, was that they introduced um, uh, solar and then everything broke down and there was nobody there who could repair it. And so right. one of the things that uh, there's just a new program in Afghanistan right now where they're training women to maintain solar panels. So trying to learn from that, those past mistakes. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting that we haven't learned as much about uh, is on the... Um, the biofuels that often there's a there's a global attempt to grow more biofuels to uh, fight climate change, and that's led to a lot of land grabbing in conflict affected countries, or depending on your perspective, yeah. large scale land acquisitions. Yes. Um, there's a question from Ye Wen: uh, Is water a renewable resource? You know, and recently uh, some water sources are drying up. And we're seeing uh, losses, especially in springs and streams. So that's kind of locally, uh, you know, this question, you know, it's simply because it's renewable doesn't mean it's necessarily always going to be there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this speaks to the whole issue of climate change, that we're just seeing shifts in the variability and, of, you know, availability of water resources globally. What once was assumed to be a highly renewable resource in many parts of the world is no longer. Um, this also speaks to the issue of fossil groundwater, that that is not renewable. I mean, if you tap, if you use up an aquifer and rely upon solely a um, ancient aquifer, um, you will not, you know, that is not a sustainable source of water. So we have one last question uh, that just came in from Vanessa Ospina. What are the most important tools to empower women in governance processes related to land tenure or natural resources, especially in traditional cultures that is, uh, um, in which women's participation is difficult? Um, I might let you talk about some of the work that you're seeing in Afghanistan, but I think you know from what we saw in some of the case studies um, was that this is variable too. So a lot of the women, after they return from refugee camps in some of our case studies in um, Eastern Congo, um, 
they had to take on leadership roles in the refugee camps. And um, so it is really about ensuring that women have a place at the table. It may be that it's a women's table where they're making decisions about water resources, but it is about opening up opportunities to listen to women about what are the best solutions that could help benefit um, their particular um, families, um, their communities. And I don't know if you want to just talk about the specific example, which I think. Um, I think that you, you highlighted, I think, a couple of good resources that are in the books. Um, uh, a couple of things that I would also say is that, so th there are a wide range of tools and uh, whether there's quotas or women's only spaces, like kind of parallel spaces, right. um, uh, um, making sure that this is that these are considered in standard assessment methodologies, whether it's a social impact assessment or um, so there, there are different tools that are out there. Um, th I think this is a really important question that uh, one can spend a whole MOOC on. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to uh, highlight uh, one particular tool, um, the new knowledge platform, ah, yes. Gender, Natural Resources, Climate and Peace, uh, which is co-hosted by the Environmental Peace Building Association and the joint uh, UN program on women, natural resources and peace. So that's with uh, UNDP, UN Environment, UN Women and the Peace Building Support Office. Uh, and we will share the URL for that. But the, the, there is uh, an effort to try to bring together these different threads. Uh, and I, I remember um, a colleague was, uh, in, was uh, bemoaning the fact a couple months ago that you know, there's a lot of work on women in environment, a lot of work on women in peace, a lot of work on environment in peace. But we don't have was her complaint. We don't have this space for women, environment, and peace all together. And I'm, I'm very happy to say now we do. It's there, and the question of what we've learned about the effectiveness of these different tools, how to deploy them individually and uh, uh, as part of a toolbox. Th that's the whole point of this knowledge platform and the associated community of practice. And so, if, if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to check out www dot gender dash n r dash peace dot org again that's www dot gender dash n r dash peace dot org and Erica I think we are coming to the end of the office hour uh, are there any final uh, thoughts that you would like to share with people um no but just to thank everyone for taking the time to join us and for participating in the MOOC um, just the last thing to note that we will be holding the first environmental peace building conference um, at UC Irvine in October. The exact dates are the 22nd. 23rd through 25th. 23rd to 25th of October. All the information is available online and it would be wonderful to have um, as many of you um, participate in the conference, and we are continuing to populate um, the agenda. Thank you very much, and we will see everyone next week.